the biggest divide that exists in the nutrition space on the internet especially is veganism and carnivore why do you think there is this massive divide in nutrition especially online i think we first need to acknowledge that the online space and the the views that we see the whole sleuth of extreme views we see are are not representative of the typical views held by academics Hmm. it's helpful uh to to build an audience and to drive engagement if you have a contrarian or different (laughs) position to the consensus particularly for for people that are you know lack lack trust and so we we see these extreme views online but we often i think see that and presume that the science is not settled that the science is confused look at all these people with completely contradictory viewpoints but we, we need to recognize that firstly, a lot of these viewpoints that we're seeing on social media that we're exposed to are not coming from domain specific experts. And secondly, if you go and speak to domain specific experts, academics, you'll see that while they don't agree on everything, they do agree on the, the bulk majority of things when it comes to how food influences our health. You know, both in the short term and the long term. I think the more inconspicuous kind of reason for why there are these absolute positions exist, you know, the, the first kind of reason I just spoke to there about these extreme, you know, absolute positions, absolute sell, they drive engagement. And not everyone's uh, agenda is to improve public health. There are a lot of different agendas out there, so, you know, selling products, building profile, all the things, right? Uh, the more inconspicuous reason is that you know, we all eat food th- two, three, four times a day. And I think that leads to many pe- people feeling like they, because of that, they can have a very strong opinion on nutrition and food. And this is different to other fields of science. You know, if you or I wanted to learn about the stars or the galaxies or the planets, you know, we're going to want to listen to an astronomer or an astrophysicist, someone that's an actual expert in that that field. And so online we have a lot of noise and and I think distraction, confusion, because there are a lot of voices speaking about food that are not domain specific experts. And I don't think that necessarily all of these people have bad intention. You know, there's a thing called the Dunning Kruger effect. And it's where, you know, you, you're overestimating your capabilities based on the level of knowledge that you actually have. And So what I see online is deep convictions, absolutes, you know, sensationalized posts, not having context. And that's the opposite of scientific thinking. Scientific thinking is understanding there's uncertainty, is being open-minded, having humility so that you can actually objectively review all data, whether it is in line with your current position or it challenges it. And the idea of a scientific thinker or approach is that with that open mind, you allow your views and positions to evolve over time. If, if we're not approaching science like that, then what can happen is we have a, a current pre-held view and we just go out and look for evidence to reaffirm that and double down on it. How much of the absolutes that we see online do you think are coming from a place of bio-individuality. For example, Paul Saladino feels amazing when he eats a certain way, but someone else wouldn't feel that way. I feel like people have this sense of ownership over the way they eat and they think it's the best way to eat because they feel good doing it. Do you feel like 
there's a different diet for everyone or everyone should kind of be eating the same way. Does that make sense? There's a few parts to answering that. One is I think we often assume that short-term changes in health reflect long-term disease risk. Mm. And you know that's not always the case. For example, smoking can help aid weight loss, but smoking increases cancer long-term. Um, so I think that's that's one explanation for that. I don't think that we're all genetically so different such that one person does best long-term on a carnival diet and another person does best on a vegan diet over 50, 60, 70 years. But I, I do think that you know, there is no single dietary brand or label that is best. There's a theme and... You know, this is a little bit more great. It's less absolute, which is why this is not really that popular. <laughs> you know, that theme that you see in the literature that's associated with the best long term health, so lower risk of various types of cancer, lower risk of metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes or non alcoholic fatty liver disease, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, dementia, et cetera, is a diet that's high in fiber, it's low in saturated fat, it has a bias for plant protein, but it can include animal protein. So relative to a, to a standard Western diet, it has more plant protein. And it limits ultra-processed foods that have added sugars, salt, oil, and other kind of artificial or uh, even natural additives that you wouldn't find in your kitchen and you wouldn't use in, in everyday cooking. Now, that theme I just described that could be a Mediterranean style diet. It could be a pescatarian diet. It could be a plant-based diet. It could be low carb. It could be high carb. Mm. So I think there's flexibility within that for the individual to you know, adjust and play around and try things and then look at blood work and go back to the drawing board. And we, you know, maybe that's something that we'll discuss, but that's m my advice to people is very much to within that theme, find a way of eating that leaves you feeling good today is something that you can adhere to because you enjoy it because none of this matters if you're only doing it for two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you going to do for decades? We're talking about lifetime exposure here. That's really what shifts the needle in terms of risk of these diseases uh, and what leaves your blood work and important uh, predictors of longevity, risk factors, what leaves them in good shape. And... You know, so there is a, a degree of personalization that I 100% agree with within that theme, but I just don't think it's you know, as extreme as one person does best on all meat and the other person does best on whole plants.